الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam has just performed the hajj the first the last hajj he would ever perform and he has given the khutbatul wida or the farewell khutbah from arafat and then he asked the ummah the hujjaj do you bear witness that i have delivered the message and they said yes it was after this that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sent down revelation in which he said ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem اليوم اكملت لكم دينكم واتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الاسلام دينا this day have i made your deen for you perfect and completed my favor unto you and have ordained for you islam your deen so the job is done the deen is perfect everything is complete and then nabi muhammad alayhi salatu waslam returns to medina and he has about 81 days left in his blessed life before allah calls him away from this world During these 81 days another revelation comes down And so al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum ila akhir al-aya is not the last revelation No On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma and in the hadith recorded in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari We are told that the last revelation to come down was the revelation in Surah Al-Baqarah verses or ayah 279 280 in which Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala addressed those who believed in him ya ayyuhal ladina amanu not the kuffar he is speaking to those who believe in Allah and then he went on to give a command ittaqullah fear Allah so when he addresses us and then declares fear Allah something very important is about to be spoken wa dharu ma baqiya min ar-riba in kuntum mu'minin 
Fear Allah and give up what remains of your demand for riba. If you are indeed a people who believe in Allah, why, why should this revelation come down last? That is question number one. Revelation has been coming down since the time of Adam alayhi salam. Some of it recorded, some of it not. For thousands of years revelation is coming down. And this is the last word to come down. No more after this. Why should it be riba? If this is so important to be chosen as the last revelation, every other khutbah for Jummah should be on riba. Every other khutbah on Jummah should be on riba. If this is so important, that it is chosen as the last word to come down after thousands of years of revelation. How often does the khutbah of Salatul Jum'ah address the subject of riba? How often? Question number two. Why should this revelation come down after Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has asked, Have I delivered the message? Do you bear witness? And they said yes. And then revelation comes down to say, Today the job is finished. The religion is perfected. It is completed. It is after that statement is made that according to Abdullah ibn Abbas in the hadith recorded in Sahih Bukhari that Allah sends down one more revelation and this is the last revelation. What is the implication of sending down one more revelation after having said the job is done? The religion is perfected. The revelation is complete. Could it be that herein lies the greatest of all dangers that this ummah, that this religion can ever face? That herein lies what can be potentially destructive for the whole deen and for the whole ummah? Riba. We need to ponder and to reflect over these two questions. What is riba? The revelation goes on to say that Whosoever receives the warning concerning the prohibition of riba and then decides to stop, no more, to turn away, fantaha, falahu ma salaf, he can keep whatever he has earned. The state will not come after him. وَأَمْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ And the matter is now transferred from this court to that court. The revelation also said for the money lender that if he gives up his demand for riba فَلَكُمْ رُؤُسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ You are entitled to the return of your رَأْسُ الْمَالِ 
the principal son. Oh, oh, now I understand. That money was lent to be returned with an additional amount. That you will return to the money lender the principal sum plus an additional amount. And if you forego that additional amount, which is riba, you are entitled to the return of the principal sum. And so lending money on what today is called interest, I don't know why they choose the word interest. It's an interesting subject, isn't it? How come they choose the word interest for riba? <laughs> well, they used to have another word in the old of the English language, user. Hmm? But now, they don't like the word homosexual, so they choose a nicer word, gay. Gay. <laughs> so maybe the word usury is too loaded. We don't want that baggage. So they coin, they coin an interesting new word for riba. They call it interest. So, lending money on interest, what they call interest, is lending money on riba, a riba transaction, an additional amount. Why has Allah prohibited it? Not just made it haram, more than that, more than that. If you persist in lending money on interest, and of course, when you put your money in a fixed deposit in the bank, and you take the interest, or when you buy something, they give the word a bas a, a, a what you call it, a ghusl? and they come out with a nice new word, they call it a bond. You are, you're buying a bond, you are a money lender. You're lending money on interest. It doesn't matter whether you're lending it on interest to your next door neighbor, or to your brother's son, or to the bank. You're a money lender. And Allah, in the very last revelation to come down in the Quran, declares war on the money lender. Not only does Allah declare war on the money lender, فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The Messenger of Allah also declares war on the money lender. We have an interesting question to ask, if you don't mind. If Allah is at war with the money lender, and if the Prophet of Allah is at war with the money lender, and we are not at war with the money lender, what is going to happen to us? Are we people who are actually Muslims? Are we submitting to Allah? Or are we submitting to something else? Do we have a surprise waiting for us in the grave? When the angels come to question, and we say we are Muslims, and the angels say, you lie! You lie! Allah is at war. The messenger of Allah is at war. And we are not at war. Are we Muslims? <laughs> Why is it that for riba Allah declares war? What is it 
but it's so dangerous in riba. Why is it haram? Does the Quran answer that question? It does. It gives several answers. It says, for example, <coughs> of the money lender, <coughs> that he, po he pronounces or he advances an argument. He says, Inna mithlu riba. He says, and we are just doing business. It's just business when we lend money on interest. Riba is like business. Innam al mislu riba. But then Allah responds and He says, No. Wa ahalla Allahu al bay'a wa harram al riba. He gives us a contrast between business and riba. He says, I have made business halal and I have made riba haram so then what is the difference between business and riba that's our homework the answer of course every businessman knows the answer we don't have to give it to the businessman Every businessman knows that when you do business, you embrace something called risiko, risiko, risiko. Not risky, yeah? Risiko. You embrace something called risk, risiko. Meaning, you can make a profit or you can suffer a loss. You take a chance. You embrace risk or risiko. And when you enter into business and you embrace that risk, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cause some to get more and cause others to get less. Some can get a profit and others can suffer a loss. So that wealth will circulate through the economy. So that wealth should not remain only with the wealthy so that the rich will remain permanently rich and the poor will remain permanently forever and ever poor. No. It is Allah who is a razak and He can provide risk. وَيَرُزُّكُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ he can give to some, he can take from others. So one day for you and one day for them. So those who are rich today and living in Damansara Heights or in Jandabad, tomorrow can be living in a Kampong because Kampong have poor people and the city has rich people. And those who today are poor can't afford motor car, so they're riding motorcycle. Dangerous. <clears throat> Tomorrow they can be rich because Allah distributes and Allah redistributes wealth. All that Islam has ever given is a free and a fair market. In our market, 
we do not distinguish between a Hindu and a Jew and a Christian and a Muslim all are equal we do not favor the Muslim against the non-Muslim not in Islam if the Jewish shopkeeper is honest trustworthy and he sells at a fair price and his goods are good we will buy from the Jewish shopkeeper we will not choose a Muslim against a Jew because he's a Muslim not in business so our market is a level playing field no favoritism no privileges for some denied to others now you might ask where is Islam today how we wish we could have governments with just one percent of knowledge of Islam just one percent of knowledge of Islam would be wonderful. And so business is important in Islam. The market must be a free and a fair market in Islam. But when you lend money on interest, that's not business. No. Why? Because the money lender does not want to embrace risico. Risk. The money lender does not want to ever suffer loss. The money lender wants to close the door for a lot. Close the door. So Allah cannot take from him and give to Indonesia and give to Pakistan and give to Bangladesh and give to Egypt. No. So he lends money on interest in order to immunize himself from loss. And if the creditor cannot repay he has something called a mortgage so he'll take your property William Shakespeare described it as a pound of flesh so here is the first reason why Allah has made riba haram answer that when the economy is based on riba, money will no longer circulate through the economy. When an economy is based on riba, the rich will now remain forever rich, and the poor will remain forever poor. When the rich are permanently rich, that's oppression. Because when the poor are permanently poor, that's oppression. Araita Levi you Kazimobiddin This is the Kazbuddin. Oppression. Islam has come to liberate the world from oppression, not to join a system of oppression. And so today we ask the question, where are the scholars of Islam? Are they not understanding the subject sufficiently? That they cannot use the mimbar to teach the subject adequately? If we were teaching the subject adequately, if we were raising our voices around the world, we would not today be embraced 
by a banking system which openly, openly lends money on interest. And nobody bothers. We go and have our lunch and the food digests, mashallah. And then we go home and we have uh, nasi biryani for dinner and the food digests. And we go home and we sleep peacefully and no problems. Because who cares about Allah's what? Who cares a fig leaf? Who cares a fig leaf that Allah is waging war? That the Prophet of Allah is waging war? We have nasi biryani and go to sleep. We're not involved in war. Are we Muslims? This is not the only reason why Allah has made riba haram and is waging war on riba. There are other lessons in the Quran. And we have only a little time left. For example, in Surah Al-Rum, وَمَا آتَيْتُم مِّن رِبًا لِيَرْبُوَ فِي أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ فَلَا يَرْبُوَ عِنَّ اللَّهِ وَمَا آتَيْتُم مِّن زَكَاةٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمَ الْمُدْعِفُونَ Allah now gives a contrast between riba and zakat. The first one was riba and business. And this one is riba and zakat, and charity. He says that if you put out your money to lend on interest, that it might increase. Oh, it's not going to increase with Allah. But if you give in charity, seeking Allah's face, meaning sincere charity, then that will increase many times with Allah. So what is there in this contrast between riba and charity that will allow us to understand the lesson why riba has been made haram? The answer again requires us to do our homework. <laughs> A perfect act of charity is one in which you give and you ask for nothing in return. Not like, well, I'm going to give you, but you must vote for me. <laughs> I'll give you, he must vote for me on election day. That's not charity. That's buying people. Some are on sale for so many ringgits, and others are say, no, they want USD. <laughs> no, no. A perfect act of charity is one in which you give and you take nothing, nothing, nothing in return. That's charity. You give and you take nothing in return. You do not even utter a harsh word. You do not even remind them that I gave you to hurt their feelings. A perfect act of charity is to give and to take nothing in return. Allah is saying to us, in Surah al rum that when you understand what is charity, you will understand what is riba. Because riba is the opposite. <laughs> riba is the opposite. In riba, the perfect act of riba is when you take, you take, you take, and you give nothing in return. If they are only taking and giving nothing in return, the Zionist control banking system around the world. You think you control your bank? Wake up. You're sleeping. <laughs> the entire banking system around the world is under one central command. And our enemies control it. Our enemies control it. 
So if the banking system around the world is only ticking and giving nothing in return, tomorrow in slavery, there are some who will not be able to understand these words today because they are still asleep. They have eyes and yet do not see. They have ears and yet do not hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. They are just like cattle. But not all people are like cattle. There are others who are people who have a capacity to think. And they can understand that is slavery down the road. How do we respond to that slavery before we end? We respond by reminding you. And this reminder, excuse me, should bring tears to our hearts. No matter how dreadful is that slavery that's coming, and for some it has already come. No matter how many dua we raise our hands and make. Allah says, In Allah la yugayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not intervene to change your condition, regardless of how hopeless that condition may be, until you take the initiative, using Allah's guidance, to change your own condition. The first thing we have to do is never borrow money and interest. Not for a motorcycle, not for a motor car, not for a house. Never put your money in a fixed deposit, <coughs> buying something called a bond <laughs> and becoming a money lender and then taking that interest to feed your wife and children, putting fire in their bed. If we have done that, make tawbah. Never again. Never again. There is much more to the subject. This is not the only form of riba. This here is also riba. This paper. But that is a subject for another day. We have a conference on riba here in Kuala Lumpur on Monday and on Tuesday. Where is it? Palace of the Golden Horses. Not cattle, horses. Palace of the Golden Horses on Monday and on Tuesday. There is a international conference on riba and your brother has to speak on Islam, the petrodollar and beyond. And you'll be surprised where this paper money is taking us. You'll be surprised. And then inshallah on Wednesday there is this lecture at the International Islamic University in Gombak at the time of Maghrib on my teacher's book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. There are flyers outside. Do please take a copy. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka inta samir alim wa tuba alina ya mulana innaka inta tawwa abu rahim We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad Nabi Muhammad has just 
performed the Hajj. The first, the last Hajj he would ever perform. And he has given the Khutbatul Wida or the farewell Khutbah from Arafat. And then he asked the Ummah, the Hujjaj, do you bear witness that I have delivered the message? And, uh, and then he went on to give a command, Ittaqallah, fear Allah. So when he addresses us and then declares fear Allah, something very important is about to be spoken. وَذَرُ مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الرِّبَا إِن كُنْتُ مُؤْمِنِينَ Fear Allah and give up what remains of your demand for riba. If you are indeed a people who believe in Allah. Why, why should this revelation come down last? That is question number one. Revelation has been coming down since the time of Adam alayhi salam. Some of it recorded, some of it not. For thousands of years revelation is coming down. And this is the last word to come down before Allah calls him away from this world. During these 81 days, another revelation comes down. And so, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم إلى آخر الآية is not the last revelation. No. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنهما and in the hadith recorded in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari we are told that the last revelation to come down was the revelation in Surah Al-Baqarah verses or ayah 279, 280, 281 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed those who believed in Him. أيها الذين آمنوا not the kuffar he's speaking to those who believe in Allah خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم. We begin with Allah's blessed name. He said yes. It was after this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sent down revelation in which he said بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأدممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا 
this day have I made your deen for you perfect and completed my favor unto you and have ordained for you Islam is your deen. So the job is done. The deen is perfect. Everything is complete. And then Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam returns to Medina and he has about 81 days left in his blessed life.